Hello, good morning. I am Mark, this is Jason, uh, and Nicola's embarrassed us both by telling you something about our background, so I won't repeat any of that. But I would uh, maybe just emphasize the entrepreneurial theme, because we're going to be talking about that a little more. Jason and I have both been lifelong entrepreneurs. Jason started his first business at 16. I was a laggard, mine was at 18. In total, we've started seven businesses between us. Some of them have, su uh, have, have succeeded beautifully, uh, and some of them haven't. Um, and we're both frequent visitors to Tel Aviv, whose startup culture is the product of a very idiosyncratic fusion of high-tech, venture capital, and military influences overlaid with a pioneering mindset. Sound familiar? Those of you who know the place will know that these characteristics could just as easily describe Silicon Valley. And that's what we're going to talk about next. I'm just testing the tech here. Excellent. It works. So that's us. So, as Nicola said, in November of last year, we joined 16 other agency leaders in a trip to Silicon Valley in Hollywood. And the fascination was obvious. Boardroom access to 20 high-profile next-generation companies and a few older generation ones too, busily reinventing themselves. So what did we learn? We've identified six learnings. We could just as easily have made that 12 or 24. We're going to breeze through those six together and try and tell you what we learnt, try and tell you how we've applied that to our agencies and to our clients. And we'll finish with the very provocation that Nicola, uh, and we didn't discuss this beforehand, uh, that Nicola just posed, which is, Various people asked us, did we not know this stuff anyway, if we describe ourselves as entrepreneurs within the digital space, uh, and why did we have to go to California to learn stuff when Silicon Roundabout is just here, or just there, to be specific? So that will be our final provocation. Learning number one that we wish to share. Vision, the importance of it. Here we're talking about the importance of a company vision which transcends the everyday and points towards a higher purpose. It also transcends the immediate capabilities of the product to provide an enduring goal. You may be familiar with Robert Browning's question, a man's reach should extend his grasp, or what's a heaven for? He posed that in the 19th century when corporate visions like the ones I'm about to share with you would have been pure fantasy. Now, the pace of technological change means most fantasies are within our grasp. Facebook's goal, if you didn't know it already, is the creation of the largest living map of human connections. Think about that. The largest living map of human connections. It's an epic goal, and it's rich, too. And amongst other things, it may explain why Facebook is spending time studying the science of influence. How do we use peer groups to help us filter the vast amounts of information we're assailed with on a daily basis? And how many groups are we typically members of anyway and what kind of influence do they exert on the way we make decisions? When your mission is the largest living map of human connections, it naturally leads to asking those big questions. And as marketeers, we very much need the answers. Google's vision, if you didn't know it already, is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And given the rate at which the world is creating data, that's a huge ambition too. For Twitter, it's instantly connecting people everywhere to what's most meaningful to them. For Airbnb, and this will be my final example, I won't keep listing people's visions, the service which allows users to rent each other's apartments, it's the sense that a world of sharing is a better one. That's also a big idea, and one which seems to be catching on in California, as we see a rash of resource sharing services, people renting out each other's apartments, cars, even prams and lawnmowers, and of course lending each other money. And what starts in California invariably ends up here. So witness the likes of Zopa and Whipcar. My agency is partnering with Whipcar now in the UK to launch them. And we'll discover whether the ownership imperative, i.e. our need to own things, is indeed giving way to an openness to renting and sharing instead. So Google, Twitter, Facebook, their visions are big, hairy, and audacious. And they're evident in the academic institutions around Silicon Valley too. We visited Stanford. And out of Stanford comes the idea that education should not be confined to the top 1% of the population, financially or intellectually. Introducing Udacity, whose first free course on artificial intelligence attracted 160,000 students from more than 190 countries, all keen to access Stanford's quality of education.
You're going to see that Mark and I have rehearsed this a thousand times, so it's going to be awesome, seamless kind of like moves between the two of us. And we do a dance at the end, which is kind of going to be really good too. Um, so um, Mark chose paper, I chose an iPad, and it's going to disappear. So really, you know, Mark's kind of set this up. The most interesting thing that we found when we were out in the valley was, you know, this perspective that there's never been a better time to build a billion dollar business. And when they talk about building a billion dollar business, they really mean it. Uh, the speed of change, the adoption of new products and behaviours, and the sheer ambition of US business to take advantage of this is genuinely inspiring. And kind of, you know, we've both been in, in and around digital for a number of years, and you, sh you could get worn out. You know, the ability of US businesses to successfully scale the web's infrastructure, I still find to be extraordinary. Um, we've all heard the numbers over time, but just Stop for a moment, close your eyes, imagine what it feels like to start a business and over a couple of years you find that 800 million people are then using Facebook. I mean, just imagine that. You start a business from scratch in a garage and 800 million people a few years later are using your business. Uh, 130 million people using LinkedIn, 5 billion searches on Google every day, a billion tweets every four days. Farmville, a game that I love, is, uh, you know, if it was a country, it'd be the fifth largest in the world. This is a vast scaling of businesses, and kind of it takes this enormous vision. This guy here is, um, I wouldn't say he's a hero of mine, but I love his product. Um, who, who knows him? Who's familiar with his face? Okay, this is Kevin Seistrom. Who uses Instagram? Put your hand up if you use Instagram. Okay, this is the clever motherfucker who came up with it. He's the founder CEO. Um, 18 months after starting it, he's now a billionaire because Facebook bought his business. And, you know, we didn't get to meet him while we were out there, probably because he was busy doing the negotiation. But the interesting thing about this guy, and the reason why I think we're all going to know him in the future, is because, you know, he didn't get a degree in computer science from Stanford. This guy was in the marketing department before he started his business, and he was a designer. Clearly, he's a talented individual, so he'd moved into other parts of the marketing department as well. And he realized that understanding engineering is important, so what he did was he taught himself to write code. And Steve, no doubt, will talk, talk about this later. It's what Decoded is all about. Certainly what I'm telling my kids. Anyone can write code. It's not a mystery. It's not difficult. Um, and what he did was he was really into Mafia Wars, which is a, a game on Zenga that some of you may know. And basically what he did was he taught himself to kind of write a, a simple bit of code which connected Foursquare to Mafia Wars. Anyway, he prototyped an idea of his and very quickly, he had a very simple version of his business that people could try out. He let his friends play with it. And then one day, as you do in the Valley, he was at a barbecue. He bumped into a couple of VCs, one from Baseline Ventures and one from Anderson Harowitz. He showed them the prototype over a cup of coffee. Ten minutes later, they'd offered him half a million in VC. And 18 months later, um, he had that offer from Facebook, which he accepted. And that's really an amazing story, really, isn't it? So um, this is, if we click here, um, this is another really interesting thing. Traditional VC is clearly really important in the Valley, and we connected with some of this when we were out there. But you know, VC is being turned on its head as well. This is a Pebble product. Um, it was developed by an ex-Blackberry developer, a guy called, I'm going to get his name wrong here, Eric, Eric Midjikovsky. Um, He'd approached VCs to develop this product. They turned him down, as they, meant, as they often do. And then he went to Kickstarter. So if any of you have an idea, if you're writing code at night, you're currently in marketing, VC have turned you down, don't give up. Go to Kickstarter. When I wrote these notes, he'd raised $6 million. He still had 19 days to go, because that's the way Kickstarter goes. It's a, it's a crowdsourcing tool for kind, of, uh, for kind of funding the development of new products. And, um, and clearly, this, this product could go very far. Um, interestingly, we found out in the valley, but also back here, a lot of corporates are watching this kind of emergence of new disruptive products, and they're learning from it. Um, at Albion, we're doing a lot of this work with some big corporate businesses. Um, O2 came to us a couple of years ago, and they were looking to develop a disruptive new mobile phone network in this country, and we helped them develop GIFGAF. I mean, our offices are across the road. Our understanding of how to do startup was what appealed to them. You know, we'd worked on Skype for five years, 
and they knew that incubating a new business requires a different mindset. And this was part of the mindset that we were, you know, you've constantly got to understand by going out to the valley, by getting out to Israel to see what they're doing out there, or hanging out in Eastern Europe, as I try and do as often as possible. Um, so, it's funny this clicker, you, I click, it sends a sign to them, they then move the chart. It's a, it's a form of technology. This is where I hand seamlessly over to Mark on data. So, Jason mentioned data. What happens when you preside, as Google does, over five billion searches a day? And of course, it's not just Google we're talking about, but granular access to huge amounts of customer interactions typified most of these next generation companies. What we're witnessing is no less than a data revolution. As consumers interact with social platforms, with games, with information, with each other, they're revealing information about their preferences and behaviours like never before. And they're doing it effortlessly, in volumes unimaginable only a decade ago. And this is not just opening up opportunities for the digital pure plays like Facebook, which learn more about their users by the second, but also for traditional media brands, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Disney, are getting to know their customers in ways that never seemed possible before. Warners, for example, renting out their movies on Facebook. Historically, they would have had no idea other than through audience research as to who was watching their films in movie theaters. Now they're using like, sites like eBay to monitor what movies are being, are being pirated on eBay and then using manufacturing demand technology to manufacturing on demand technology to make those films and sell them directly using channels like Facebook, which in theory gives them access to a wealth of consumer behavior they could only dream of before. Disney, on the other hand, have used a fairly primitive source of data, YouTube, to do something even more imaginative than renting out movies on Facebook. Meet DJ Pogo, a 16-year-old kid who likes making, uh, likes making mashups of Disney films. Only a few short years ago, Disney, who make pr Chinese protectionism look mild, would have closed him down. Now they're giving him access to high-res content to make even better mashups. Why? Because his latest Alice in, Wonder, Alice in Wonderland mashup has 7.6 million views as an, and is introducing Alice to a new audience. Let's just have a, uh, a quick look at it. just weren't really working. So how are we exploiting this kind of thinking, as an example? Well, here's one, one way for our client Visit Wales. Time was when a tourist board would make a TV ad and then amplify the message using social media. Working with W&K London, we recently recruited someone to visit Wales. His name was Piers. His name is Piers. Hotels, restaurants, and leisure facilities in Wales pitched to Piers via his Facebook page to visit them on his tour. We filmed the result and broadcast it as a TV ad. In other words, the TV ad amplified the social media campaign, an inversion of the usual order of things. So the other, the other, one of the other principles we learn when we're out there is kind of this thought of always in beta. It's a, um, you know, it sounds cliched, but it's a bit like this, this tent. You know, being the first to use something uh, when it's just made is absolutely what they believe out in the valley, and it's certainly what we should be practicing here. You know, expressions like if you don't fail, you're not trying hard enough, or test, 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 hack days, launch and learn, always in beta. This is the language of the valley, and it's something that we should get far more comfortable with. One of the reasons we're not quite so comfortable with it is it's because failing is not really part of our culture. I don't know about you guys, but when I started out in the industry, you know, I was learning off art directors who would perfect everything down to the minutest of detail and throw me out of their offices if they weren't happy with something. And really, that's not the way to do it these days. Um, just kind of like hacking something together and get it going is, is more the right mentality. And need to say, just embracing failure uh, and not always succeeding is something that we should feel much better about. Uh, I was going to tell you about Mark failing on something, but we're running out of time, and uh, Mark will probably be embarrassed if I do so. We should just 
quickly just talk to you a little bit about one guy who we did meet in, uh, at Google who was really impressive. Um, it's a guy called Albert Savoyer. He's the technology director of Google. And he talked about pre-typing. And there's a really interesting, it's not even a book, it's a, mag a little magazine he's created, which basically just celebrates the idea of not spending lots of money on prototyping, but doing everything you can to hack an idea together, seeing whether it works, and then moving on. But it's all about using data in response to that and working out whether people actually use your idea or not. Um, he says, his mantra is really interesting. He says, now beats later, simple beats complex, Commitment beats committees, and data beats opinions. And we can learn a lot from this guy. Penultimately, boiling the frog. There were numerous instances on this trip when I turned to another fellow traveler, Mark Justy, and saw myself staring back. Not just because we're both middle-aged men with receding hairlines, but because we recognized in various companies that we visited a huge threat to traditional models of advertising and marketing. In January, in Campaign Magazine, Mark referred to that as boiling the frog. So what exactly is that threat? Simply expressed, it's the threat of being left behind. Some of the emerging companies in California have a scale that is eye-watering. They have access to unimaginably rich levels of customer data. They've got the ability to integrate systems. Some of them own their own boutique businesses in the areas of apps and social media. Others have offshore production facilities. Many of them have speed, agility, and inventiveness. They have transparent and ROI-oriented payment models. And they don't necessarily need traditional creative agencies to, li to deliver much of this. One example for you, Zynga, who we'll, I think, hear from a little later on, can integrate your client's brand, in brand into their games weaving it straight into their narrative in ways which enjoy, apparently, according to Zynga, high user acceptance and likability, replacing traditional advertising formats. That, of course, is the glass is half empty view of what we saw. The glass is half full view says, clients will always need the creativity that we bring, the depth of expertise we have in communications, the breadth of solutions and media neutrality we can provide, and the talent we can access but let's not take it for granted, or our frogs will be collectively boiled. Advertising needs to reinvent itself, just like every other industry, which I guess is partly why Nicola called for this event today. Before I leave the subject of the advertising industry and Jason wraps up, I've got one further note of reassurance for you. How many of you have had issues with IT when doing PowerPoint presentations? Well, the wonderfully reassuring thing about going to the heart of Silicon Valley right into the boardrooms of these great tech companies is that loads of them struggled with their PowerPoint presentations too. It is truly a global phenomenon. So kind of finally, uh, probably the final point we'll just leave you with is this thought of Silicon London. I think, you know, we need to stop beating ourselves up uh, about not being Silicon Valley um, and realize we're actually on the brink of being something else. It's our own thing. Um, most of Silicon Valley's money is made in infrastructure. You know, businesses like Cisco, Oracle, even Facebook is an infrastructure business, arguably. It's the infrastructure of the social web now. These guys are brilliant at engineering. It's not surprising because they've got the world's greatest concentration of engineers. They're brilliant at scaling because they've got access to enormous amounts of capital. But London doesn't have enough engineers and doesn't have enough capital probably to compete head on with the valley. But I think we need to play to our strengths. And I think, we've, I think we do have strengths. We've, we can play a very different game. So coming home from the trade mission, we all talked about what are the strengths of London, what can we build on, and we've got three strengths that I thought, I'd, which are ideas I'd like to leave you with. Our first strength is we've got designers. We've got lots of designers, and designers are extremely fashionable right now. Uh, they're very fashionable in Silicon Valley for two reasons. One, because Steve Jobs has built the most valuable business on earth on the back of design principles. And then also, there are evidence now of businesses like Instagram coming through because they've been designed quite so beautifully. And we've got designers by the thousand in this, country, in this city. Um, London's also got the creative industries, and we're the, very much at the heart of this. Um, we've got people who can imagine the future. And I think most importantly, we're at that kind of wonderful combination of being the hub of Europe and an island nation that welcomes talent in. This is kind of the final chart. This is a, a guy who's developing a business at the moment in our offices. He's called Emi Gao, front page of Forbes. He's 25 years old, Romanian. He's got his tech in Romania, but he's building his business in London. This could be the next Nicholas Enstrom of Skype. This could be the next billion dollar startup. Um, and he's doing it here across the road, and we should feel very, very good about that. 
Anyway, thank you very much.